on the 23rd of March at 3 o'clock. At 3.30 in the afternoon, Montgomery, having read the weather report, telephoned Simpson and Dempsey, who were in readiness on the banks of the Rhine, and gave them orders to begin fording during the night. While Montgomery's artillery was firing hurricane fire along the right bank of the Rhine, trying to destroy the batteries advanced by the enemy in forward firing positions, four battalions of the 51st Scottish Division quietly got into assault boats and set off from the shore. Seven minutes later, they were already reporting that they had landed on the opposite shore. Montgomery had approached the Rhine 14 days before the crossing, but his preparations for the operation had already been underway for months. From the time the Second Army drew up a plan for the crossing and the engineer units were tasked with delivering the crossing facilities, Montgomery insisted that he be provided with a solid supply of supplies before he could begin crossing this water obstacle. While supplies were being built up, Allied aircraft bombed the right bank and smoke screens concealed from the enemy Montgomery's careful preparations for the crossing. To force the Rhine, Montgomery concentrated 26 infantry divisions, five armoured brigades and a separate commando brigade. The 26 divisions included two airborne divisions, which were intended to be thrown in during the day, after the first echelon had forced the river. Night Airborne Airborne was ruled out, since an airborne landing on the right bank before dawn would have to abandon artillery preparation. In addition, it was believed that dropping the landing during the day would cause demoralisation in the rear of the enemy and accelerate its collapse. At dawn on 24 March, the main forces of four divisions landed on the east bank of the Rhine and accelerated expansion of their bridgeheads. At 10 a.m. the landing began. The first group of transport planes flew across the Rhine, making their way among the black clubs of bursting shells, which the German anti-aircraft guns dotted the entire sky. That morning I flew out to Hodge's command post, and we had to circle in the air until a long string of P-47s and a few downed P-46s whizzed past our aircraft. In three hours, 1,700 aircraft and 1,300 gliders landed 14,000 men from the British 6 and American 17th Airborne Divisions behind enemy lines in Dempsey's offensive strip. The Allies suffered far fewer casualties in this daylight landing than in any other airborne operation in the entire war. Less than 4% of the gliders were destroyed by enemy fire. By the end of the day, we were missing only 55 aircraft. A few months ago, studying the problem of forcing the Rhine, I foresaw that if the enemy gets enough time to prepare the defence on the east bank, we would need airborne troops to occupy the bridgehead. But we so successfully defeated the Germans west of the Rhine that on the eastern bank managed to leave only a few units that lost combat effectiveness. As a result of the crushing defeat of the enemy west of the Rhine, his resistance on the east bank was disorganised and the morale of the Germans undermined. Did Monty forced the river from the move, as Patton had done, he could have dispensed with the effort. It took him to carry out his much-publicised forcing. Fourteen days of preparation for the forcing allowed the enemy to entrench on the right bank and bring up artillery. Had it not been for our pre-bridge fortification at Remagen, which diverted considerable enemy forces, the Germans could have created a strong defence in Montgomery's line of action, and without airborne troops the forcing would have been impossible. When Patton rushed from his bridgehead in the direction of Frankfurt, and Montgomery united the scattered bridgeheads together before launching an offensive north of the Ruhr, I cancelled the order that for a fortnight constrained Hodge's action at the bridgehead at Remagenier intending his bridgehead by about one kilometre a day, as I had ordered. Hodges had assembled all three corps of the First Army in a 56-kilometre strip along the river bank, a strip that stretched gradually to the right and left of the stone balls of Ludendorff's ruined bridge. Last week, correspondents asked me what explained our timidity, why we did not dare to rush forward from Remagen and get to Berlin before the Russians do. Learned men in London again raised a fuss, accusing us of still not having learnt the lessons of lightning warfare, not wishing to reveal our plans. I calmed the critics by assuring them that we could strike from Remagen and would do so as soon as the moment was favourable. The plan for a breakthrough in the Remagen area continued to be a rough sketch which we had drawn up three months earlier when Hodges, having eliminated the Ardennes bulge, began the attack on Bonn. At that time we had assumed that the First Army would turn southeast and link up with the Third Army, after the latter had crossed the Rhine. Once Patton would have crossed the Rhine, he was to turn and force the main river. Combined, the two armies would cover the Rue from the south, tightening a loop around it, 
moving towards the Third Army advancing from the North AT. Now that Hodges had established a pre-bridge fortification south of Bonn at Remagen, he had to stick to this original plan. First, he was to move his tanks down the motorway to Frankfurt. At Limburg, he was to turn east and move along the Lahn River Valley to Giessen, where his troops would link up with Patton, advancing from Maine. The First and Third Armies were then to advance in two parallel columns, Hodges on the left and Patton on the right. Along the wide Wetterow Corridor to join Simpson, after joining Hodges and Simpson's armies, would proceed to eliminate the German troops trapped in the encirclement, while Patton would turn his army to the east and prepare to advance towards the Russians. Collins, who held positions in the left corner of the Remagen bridgehead, proposed a new offensive plan in the exact opposite direction. He proposed not to encircle the Ruhr and swing the offensive northwards along the right bank of the Rhine to connect with Montgomery's troops. This is exactly what the enemy expected from us and anticipating that we would advance north. He created defences on the River Sieg in the place where it blocked our way. When Hodges struck on 26 March, but not to the north but to the southeast, he threw the enemy completely off balance. By the evening of 26 March, the First Army had rushed down the motorway to Limburg, while Patton fought hard on his small bridgehead north of Maine, which had become the scene of a bloody struggle. When the Chief of Operations asked me by telephone whether to turn Hodges's column from the motorway to Giessen, I gave instructions to move some of the force down the road in the direction of Wiesbaden. I expected that there they could help the Third Army to cross the Maine, and at the same time take the enemy in a ring between the Maine and the Rhine. Hey, it will be good for the First Army to get the Third out of trouble, I said. Patton's boys were getting a little too arrogant. I had another purpose for this manoeuvre. I thought that the 9th Armoured Division would rush south and cut off Wee Spaden and allow us to take that city without a fight. Back in England, when Thorson indulged in memories of his time in World War I in Weisbaden, then occupied by the French, we saw this city as the most convenient place for our command post. It was only when our leading units stormed the city that it became clear to us that the Air Force was three months ahead of us. Air bombardment had raised the city's fine hotels to the ground and damaged its marvellous curhouse. Anticipating our advance west of the Rhine, Brereton's headquarters asked me to support their plan of throwing in an airborne assault in the neighbourhood of Cassel, southeast of Paderborn, where we were to link up with Simpson. Brigadier General Floyd Park, Chief of Staff of the 1st Allied Airborne Army, suggested 20 April as a tentative date for the airborne drop. But we don't need your paratroopers, I objected. We must be in Castle by 10 April. Besides, I would prefer to use your planes for cargo transfer. We are likely to be in an extremely difficult supply situation until we have a couple of railway bridges over the Rhine. I subsequently announced to Bedell Smith that the day of 10 April had been intended by me as the very deadline. In fact, I'd hoped to be in Castle before the 1st of April. We got there a day late. The proposal to drop the paratroopers in Kassel was the last project put forward by the Airborne Army Command. We had already rejected a good dozen such proposals before that. I did not want transport aviation to be used to throw out the airborne paratroopers, as had been done at Kurnai, because the engineers could not build a railway bridge across the Rhine before 20 April. Therefore, we expected that once our columns deepened east of the Ruha, we would be short of fuel and ammunition. That is when we would become in desperate need of Brereton's aircraft. By 30 March, Morris Rose's 3rd Armoured Division approached Paderborn. The city was already in sight when the division encountered desperate resistance from SS men drawn from nearby reserve tank units. They fought with fanatical tenacity. Although Rose destroyed the bulk of this makeshift barrier, the remnants of it managed to escape into the Haas Massif, where the Germans had established a last bastion of defence. The next day Rose was killed in action. Meanwhile, Simpson was still impatiently thrashing about on his cramped pre-bridge fortification east of the Rhine, to which he was confined, while Montgomery used the 9th Army bridges to rush reinforcements to Dempsey's army. In order to familiarise Simpson with the plans for the capture of the Ruhr, after we would link up with him near Paderborn, I flew north to him. Simpson's command post was in the city of Munich Gladbach. Since the Ardennes battles, Big Simp, as he was affectionately called by the soldiers, without knowing rest, spent three and a half months under Monty's command, impatiently waiting for the moment when he could finally return back to the American Army group.
perhaps because the Ninth Army was the most compliant of all the U.S. formations. Simpson had carried his service under British command without incident or clash. Now, however, he was offended. First, by being forced to tramp for a fortnight on the west bank of the Rhine, and second, by having to wait until Dempsey had crossed the bridges the Ninth Army had built for him. Monty ordered first of all to ensure that Dempsey's offensive was in the direction of the main British strike towards Hamburg and further to the shore of the Baltic Sea. Here, Dempsey was to safeguard Denmark from the danger of liberation by the Red Army, still unaware of the purpose of the British manoeuvre. We complained about the diversion of British forces to the north, for despite the approach of Soviet troops to the North Sea, we thought more about the destruction of the remnants of the German army and post-war political problems did not touch us much. Two days earlier, the Associated Press had telephoned us at night from Paris with the news that the Senate Military Affairs Committee had approved the nomination of Devers, Patton, Hodges and myself for the fourth general's star. The next morning, as I put on the jacket I'd had prepared for my trip to the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, I found that my orderly had already pinned additional stars on my epaulette. However, when I got on the plane, I took them off. Let's wait, I said to the orderly, until the official order comes, or better yet, until we read about it in the Stars and Stripes. As soon as Simpson received permission to break out of his bridgehead, he threw the 2nd Armoured Division across the Northern Rue and on 1 April, exactly seven days after he had crossed the Rhine, joined HS Guise at Lipstate. Another two days later, Eisenhower returned the 3rd Army 12th Army Group, and under my command gathered an impressive group of troops consisting of 45 American divisions. At the same time, we moved a state task force from Nama back to Luxembourg. There was no longer any need for me to stay close to Monty. In the territory around which we closed the Ring of Encirclement, remained defeated Army Group B model, an association larger than the one that Paulus surrendered to Zhukov in Stalingrad. The remnants of three German armies had fallen into a trap. The veterans of the Pars de Calais and the Ardennes were mixed with green youths from the Hitler Youth, who were hastily pulled on shabby military uniforms hung on them like scarecrows. In general, the Army Group model consisted of six Army Corps, combining the main forces of 17 divisions, to them should be added another 100,000 men from anti-aircraft units, which have long defended the Ruhr, creating a strong anti-aircraft defence. Twice the enemy tried to break the encirclement ring, and twice we threw him back. Anticipating that we will have to lead a protracted campaign east of the Rhine, we created in early January the 15th American Army under the command of Jero. In place of Jero, we sent to the 5th Corps, seen Hugner of the 1st Division. However, enemy resistance west of the Rhine collapsed so quickly that we abandoned the plan to use the army Jero at the front and ordered her to stay on the west bank of the Rhine, combining the defense of this line with the tasks of occupation. Meanwhile, while the main American forces were moving east on a 320-kilometer front along the hills of Thuringia to meet the Russians, who were now separated from the LB only some 160 kilometers. I allocated 18 divisions to eliminate the Ruhr, but for 18 days, the enemy stubbornly defended in the Ruhr, and we forced our way through the doomed cities, which were densely dotted with the Ruhr basin. On 18 April, when the enemy ceased resistance, we took 325,000 prisoners. This was more than twice the number on which the First Army had counted, beginning the operation to eliminate the encircled group. The intelligence reported that Field Marshal Model was encircled in the Ruhr with his troops. I had not forgotten how that dry Prussian had blocked our advance across the Siegfried Line in September and told the intelligence chief to promise a medal to whoever captured Model. However, all that remained of Model in the Ruhr was a huge Mercedes-Benz staff car rumoured to belong to the German Field Marshal. This car was given to me by Ridgeway. The Allied front line from the Bavarian foothills in the south moved east crossed the flowering fields of mustard and reached Hanover, a city located only 240 kilometers from Berlin. The enemy resistance was weakening more and more, and only the hardened Nazis and SS men continued to fight desperately, seeing no prospects in front of them. In cottages painted in cheerful, bright colors, German housewives looked out from behind lace curtains, casting timid glances at our columns rumbling through the streets of the towns in pursuit of the fleeing German army. Only in the Fransonian town of Aschaffenburg, 32 kilometers from Frankfurt up the main, did Goebel's desperate incantations work on the population to take up arms. In 1934, Hitler, 
fearing that the French would not accept the remilitarization of the Rhineland and start hostilities, had built a defensive belt along the main river that ran through Aschaffenburg. But now the population of this town dared to oppose the Allies, not because of their loyalty to the Nazi regime. The people of Aschaffenburg believed the words of the local Nazi leader. You must fight for your lives, he told them, for surrender means enslavement, for there is no third way. Our troops, as they entered the town, saw the corpses of German officers hanging from street lamps. They had been hanged for calling for surrender. Women and children pelted American soldiers with hand grenades from rooftops. From the five nearby hospitals, wounded German soldiers limping on crutches stretched to a Schaffenberg to join the battle. Not wishing to suffer the casualties inevitable in street fighting, our troops withdrew and called in the bomber air force. When the rumble of explosions died down and the stones of collapsing walls covered the motionless bodies of the city's defenders, the Nazi commander of the defense of Aschaffenburg, Major von Lambert, timidly climbed out of hiding, holding a white flag in his hand. Our columns passed the small gingerbread-like houses that dot the hillsides of Hesse. They also passed small industrial plants scattered outside the Ruhr Basin. Near them were the sullen wire fences into which the slaves of Germany were driven after work. There was now utter chaos behind the barbed wire. The prisoners had looted all the warehouses before breaking free. Displaced persons wandered aimlessly through the streets of towns where Germans fearfully closed their windows with shutters, and stocky Baltic girls peddled bicycles seized from their former German masters. Small groups of Italians dragged with difficulty along the roads, bending under the weight of tightly packed duffel bags. Many had copper cooking utensils hanging from their shoulders, glistening in the sun. Column after column of American trucks came westward, crowded with French soldiers in tattered, faded uniforms. They were returning to France, to a homeland they had not seen since 1940. The Germans' last hopes for a protracted war and peace negotiations had collapsed. This was achieved thanks to the strength of our army and the superiority of its equipment. Before we had built bridges across the Rhine at Remagen, some Germans could still believe that their new jet aircraft could neutralize our air superiority. The enemy spared no expense in the production of jet aircraft. According to our records, his underground factories produced between 600 and 800 of these high-speed fighters. Even in March 1945, we estimate that the enemy's production capabilities allowed him to produce 200 jet aircraft per month. The German Air Command demanded that pilots taken from the infantry be returned to the Air Force. At a good half-dozen aerodromes, combat training of pilots for jet aircraft was in full swing. However, jet aviation was late, as late and Hitler's aeroplane shells. If von Rundstedt in the Ardennes managed to disrupt our offensive, the enemy would have gained time and would have been able to use their advantage in jet aircraft. But our armies poured across the Rhineland, surrounded the Ruhr and moved further east. They captured the underground aircraft factories before the jets could engage. The last illusion was gone. Now Goebbels had no choice but to intimidate the German people with the threat of Russian repression. One evening, shortly after we had eliminated the Ardennes bulge and began the advance to the Rhine, Eisenhower consulted with me about how to avoid an accidental clash with Soviet troops when they met the Red Army somewhere in the center of Germany. Although at that time we were still separated by almost 800 kilometers, the Soviet offensive launched on 12 January was progressing well and the Russians could break into Germany through Poland. Some even thought that the Red Army could reach the Oder on Germany's eastern border. Eisenhower could no longer delay any further in establishing the east-west boundary line, for any recommendation from the Allied High Command on the matter was to be sent to Kremlin. Like Eisenhower, I did not trust predetermined identification signals and even less relied on radio communication with Red Army units. Identification signals could be confused, and ignorance of the language could negate the advantages of radio. Back at Argentan, I had stopped Patton's troops partly out of fear, lest he should run into the only British division stationed at Falaise. Now, with nearly a hundred times as many troops scattered on a front from the shores of the North Sea to Switzerland, I involuntarily shuddered at the thought of the possibility of a clash that could easily have developed into a real battle. Not only were our troops utterly ignorant of each other, but I learned that as the Russians advanced westwards, their insolence and self-confidence grew. A way out could only be found in the establishment of a demarcation line on which both our troops and those of the Red Army would stop. Undoubtedly, this demarcation line could only be a clearly visible natural boundary. Having studied the map, 
Eisenhower and I came to the conclusion that such a boundary could best serve as the Elbe. It not only flows from south to north, but also represents the last and largest natural obstacle in the path between the Rhine and the Oder, south of Magdeburg, where the Elbe turns east. The rendezvous line could be established on the Melde River all the way to the Czechoslovakian border. Eisenhower decided to propose this boundary as the demarcation line. At that time, it seemed to us that the Elbe River was almost beyond our reach. At Magdeburg, where the Elbe turns north, it flows only 80 kilometers west of Berlin. At the point where this river was closest to our lines, it was separated from the Rhine near Cologne by a good 350 kilometers. But not only we ourselves considered the LB an almost unrealistic target for our armies. Apparently, and the Soviet command held the same opinion. Because it agreed to establish a demarcation line along the LB, although this river flows about 145 kilometers east of the proposed boundary of the Soviet occupation zone, indeed to reach the LB, as we proposed to the Russians, we had to occupy one-fifth of the zone allocated to the Soviets. The boundaries of the zones of occupation were determined by the European Consultative Commission in London. The relevant documents were discussed at Quebec, approved at Yalta, and finally sent to us at the front for familiarization. Russia was allotted the whole of East Germany, including the agricultural areas of Thuringia, only 160 kilometers from the Rhine. In addition to the rich Silesian basin, the Soviet zone of occupation included the Baltic ports. The English zone, which occupied the northwestern part of Germany, bordered the Soviet zone off the Baltic Sea, where the demarcation line ran close to Lübeck, a city famous for its submarine repair and maintenance workshops. The British zone included the Ruha, devastated but still intact, and North Sea ports long blockaded. The American zone was landlocked, so the US was assigned the port of Bremen with the surrounding area. We were to occupy the picturesque foothills of Bavaria, a beautiful mountainous region known primarily as a favorite tourist destination. To the west of us, the French were assigned to occupy the Rhineland Palatinate south of Remagen, including the industrial Sailand. The French occupation zone extended south of Bavaria and adjoined the occupation zone allocated to France in Austria. Austria, like Germany, was also to be divided among the Allies into four occupation zones. The European Consultative Commission in London came to an agreement on Berlin, according to which Berlin was to represent a kind of island in the centre of the Russian occupation zone, owned by the four powers. The capital of the Reich was to be divided into four sectors and to be subject to quadripartite control. When I asked the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force how we would supply our troops in Berlin, I was told that our trains would pass unimpeded through the Russian zone from Helmstedt, located at the western border of the Soviet occupation zone 175 kilometers from Berlin. But no corridor was allocated to us and no assurances or special guarantees were given that our trains would pass unhindered through the Soviet zone. The joint occupation of Berlin was built on trust as a symbol of allied unity. I did not dispute the grand illusion at the time, for I was no less deluded than anyone else about the Soviets' post-war plans. But this isolation of Berlin gave me misgivings, above all because it contradicted one of the basic tenets of the home front. In battle I can only assume responsibility for a section of the front. If I am sure that I can organize its supply, the supply of Berlin depended entirely on the goodwill of the Soviets. And even in my childhood days in Missouri, I learned that good neighborly relations cannot be built on dependence. Five days before Hodges and Simpson closed the ring of encirclement around the Ruhr, Eisenhower through the US military mission in Moscow radioed Stalin his plan to send a large force in the central part of the front east to the Elbe. This grouping was to include all three armies of the 12th Army Group. Meanwhile, the 21st Army Group Montgomery on our left flank was to advance northeast to the Baltic Sea with the task of cutting off the Jutland Peninsula and seize German ports on the North Sea, which were of great importance. Evers, who met the most stubborn resistance of the enemy on the Rhine and forced this river only two days after Monty, had to turn his American and French troops to the south and move through Munich to the borders of Austria, to meet the Russians advancing up the Danube to Vienna by cutting the enemy off from the Alps. We would prevent him from turning this mountain range into a last defense line. Churchill protested against Eisenhower, sending a radiogram to Moscow seeing it as an unacceptable interference of the military and political problems. 
However, he was most outraged by the plan proposed by Eisenhower. According to Eisenhower, the Prime Minister was extremely disappointed and concerned that the Allied High Command refused to reinforce Montgomery with American troops and throw him on Berlin in a desperate attempt to outflank the Russians and seize the German capital before them. On the day that Eisenhower informed Stalin that he was going to strike the main blow in the central direction by the forces of the 12th Army Group, Montgomery had just crossed the Rhine, and we rushed forward from Remagen. Over 300 kilometers separated Montgomery's bridgehead on the east bank of the Rhine from the Elbe. The path we had to take was even longer, because first we had to surround the road. In contrast to us, Zhukov had concentrated over a million soldiers on the Oder, just 48 kilometers east of Berlin. Even if we had reached the LB before Zhukov forced the Oder, there was still an 80 kilometer strip of lowlands separating the Elbe from Berlin. The western approaches to Berlin were dotted with lakes, crossed by rivers and canals. When asked Eisenhower what price, in my opinion, we will have to pay for the breakthrough from the Elbe to Berlin, I said that I estimate our probable losses of 100,000 people. Nigh too expensive a price for prestige, E. I said especially when you consider that we will have to withdraw and give way to others. If Eisenhower intended to send Montgomery to Berlin, he had to reinforce the English flank with at least one American army. The swift destruction of the German army in front of our front seemed to me a far more important matter than taking Berlin in the name of some political gain. We soldiers naively wondered at this tendency of the British to complicate the war with political considerations and non-military objectives. I was burning with the desire to clear the Ruhr as soon as possible, and all other divisions that could be released from this task, I threw forward to the LB and Mulder. After reaching the line of these rivers, I intended to occupy it with the forces of two armies, and the third army to turn to the southeast and send down the Danube to Austria to join the Red Army units, which were already approaching Vienna. Joining the Red Army in Austria, we cut off the enemy escape routes in the Austrian Alps, declared the National Redoubt of Germany but it was worth Eisenhower to accept Churchill's proposal and allocate one American army at the disposal of Monty for an offensive to the northeast to the Baltic coast, and we would have to abandon the offensive on the Danube. If the enemy managed to withdraw to redoubt, we argued, he would be able to prolong the war for a long time. A few months before, intelligence had stunned us with a fantastic plan of the German command to withdraw troops to the Austrian Alps, where, as reported, were concentrated weapons, supplies and even built aircraft factories and where the last bastion of German defence was created. There, the enemy would in all probability try to sit back and preserve the Nazi myth until the Allies had had enough of the German occupation or until they had squabbled among themselves. We were told that the troops for the redoubt's defence would primarily consist of SS units. A cursory check of the enemy's grouping on our and the Russian fronts showed a suspicious concentration of SS divisions precisely on the southern flanks of these fronts. Only after the end of the war did we learn that this lauded redoubt existed only in the imagination of a few Nazi fanatics. The rumour of it had grown to such incredible proportions that I am now simply amazed at our naivety at the time. At the time, the legendary redoubt seemed to us a very real and very serious threat that we could not neglect. It loomed over our tactical plans in the final weeks of the war. The obsessive thought of redoubt led me to be rather pessimistic about the probable date of the end of the war in Europe. As early as 24 April, two days before we joined the Russians, I told a group of congressmen invited by Eisenhower to tour the German death camps that the war could go on for another month or even a whole year. Seeing the look of alarm on the faces of some of my interlocutors, I shared with them my fears about the redoubt. The myth of the redoubt was finally dispelled by Lieutenant General Kurt Dietmar. This German radio commentator, who was called the voice of the Wehrmacht, had travelled across the LB in a small boat and surrendered to soldiers of the 9th Army. Under interrogation, Dietmar stubbornly maintained that he had only learnt about the redoubt in January 1945 from Swiss newspapers. He scoffed at our intelligence reports of thorough preparations for resistance in the Austrian Alps, but agreed that the German army could gain a foothold there if it wanted to keep fighting. But however erroneous our conclusions about the redoubt, it must still be said that in refusing to accept Churchill's proposal for an offensive on the Baltic and Berlin, we were guided by quite different considerations. If the zones of occupation had not already been defined, I could still agree that this offensive was politically worth the candle. 
but I saw no justification for our losses in fighting for a city which we would have to hand over to the Russians anyway. Even the increase in our prestige could not compensate for the heavy new casualties. On 12 April, the 1st Army entered Leipzig. Simpson's 9th Army, with the 2nd Armoured Division in the vanguard, passed north of the Haas Massif, where five enemy divisions had taken refuge. At 8 p.m., on the 309th day of fighting in Europe, the tanks of the 2nd Armoured Division reached the shore of the Elbe. Even before this, I had ordered Simpson immediately upon reaching the western bank of this river to capture a small bridgehead on the eastern bank. At the same time, I did not think to begin preparations for an offensive on Berlin, as some observers were not slow to assume. I wanted only one thing, to divert German troops from the Russian front east of Beer Rhin. However, we could probably organize an offensive on Berlin if we agreed to turn a blind eye to the inevitable losses. At that time, Zhukov still had not crossed the Oder, and Berlin lay halfway between us and the Russians. However, the approaches to Berlin from the east were incomparably more convenient for the advance of troops than the approaches from the west, because to the west of Berlin stretched marshy terrain. The first pre-bridge fortification, captured by Simpson on the east bank of the Elbe immediately south of Magdeburg, was eliminated by the combined efforts of three German divisions transferred for this purpose from Berlin. For the first time in 30 months of fighting, the second armored division was forced to retreat. However, a second pre-bridge fortification, established slightly south of the first, was able to hold. Simpson widened and deepened this bridgehead and held it for the rest of the war. On the day that the troops of the 9th Army entered the suburbs of Magdeburg, I visited Simpson at his command post. The telephone rang. Big Simp picked up the receiver, listened to the report and covered the microphone with his hand. It looks like we may capture the bridge at Magdeburg. What do we do if we take it, Brad? Nah. Damn it, I replied. We don't need any more bridgeheads on the LB. If you capture the bridge, you'll have to get at least a battalion across it, won't you? Let's hope the Hans blow it up before you want to get rid of it. The bridgehead already established south of Magdeburg was sufficient to divert enemy forces. A new bridgehead would only cost us more trouble and unnecessary losses. Thirty minutes later, when I had already put on my helmet and was about to leave, the telephone rang again. Simpson's lean face broke into a wide smile. There's no reason to worry, Brad. He laughed as he hung up. The Hans just blew up the bridge. In the last final weeks of the war, Eisenhower made more frequent flights between the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force and the bombed city of Wiesbaden, which housed our task force headquarters. On 12 April, his B-25 came down easily on a crater-strewn airfield on the outskirts of Wiesbaden. I joined Ike, and we flew the light aircraft first to Patton's command post, then to Hodge's command post. It took us all night. Our plane took a course north along the motorway, and we landed at Hersfeld, where Patton had located the 3rd Army command post in a German military camp. Both concreted lanes of the wide motorway were crowded with vehicles moving towards the front, while in the middle of it, across the grass, an endless string of refugees was being dragged to the rear. Patton was waiting for us at an airstrip set up by the roadside. Only two days earlier, the 3rd Army had captured Ordruff, the first of the Nazi death camps on our route, and George was sure to want to show it to us. You can't imagine what bastards those Hans are until you've seen this plague pit with your own eyes, he said. The heavy smell of corpses overwhelmed us even before we passed through the camp gate. More than 32 naked, dried corpses were piled in shallow graves. The corpses were also lying right in the streets, between the barracks. Liss crawled over the corpses, whose sharp, protruding bones were covered with yellow skin. The sentry showed us the place where the starving prisoners had torn the entrails out of the corpses and eaten them. The ground here was stained with caked blood. Eisenhower's face turned into a white plaster mask. Patton retreated to a corner where he vomited. My tongue dropped out of my mouth in indignation. The sight was so horrible that we were both shocked and stunned. In the coming week we were to take over other such camps, and the nightmares of Buchenwald, Earl, Belsen and Dachau were soon to shake a world that thought it had mastered the horrors of war. Happy that we had escaped from the stench, we were placed in several aeroplanes and headed at a breakneck speed towards the village of Merkers, where we landed. In this village three days ago, the 90th Division had discovered an underground cache in which the last gold reserves of the Reich were stored. The cache was discovered by accident. One evening during curfew, 
A soldier of the military police detained two women. They explained that they were following a midwife. The soldier went with them, intending to see if they were cheating. As they passed the salt mines, one of the women pointed her finger at the entrance to the mine and sand. That's where the gold is hidden. The next day, the cachet was opened. Military police found gold bars worth $100 million and 3 billion Reichsmarks. In addition, in this catch, equipped at a depth of more than 600 meters from the surface of the earth, in a dry salt mine was hidden $2 million in assignments and a somewhat smaller amount in English, Norwegian and French currency. Eisenhower and I descended into the mine in a cage operated by a German laborer. Once inside the mine, we saw sacks with the black seal of the Reichsbank. In each sack were two 25-pound gold bars. The cashier guard explained to us that the three billion Reichsmarks stored here were Germany's last reserve. They're going to need that money, he assured me, to pay for the army. Him. Tell him, I said to the interpreter, that I doubt that the German army will have to spend any more money. Hundreds of baskets and crates were piled beside the bags of gold, containing works of art taken from Berlin. We jeered at Patton. In the good old days, I said, when a soldier was complete master of his booty, you would have been the richest man in the world. Patton only grinned back contentedly. That evening we sat up late in George's dining room, which he had arranged in the scantily furnished house of the Commandant. Outside the windows the cars were rumbling. Here the Frankfurter motorway branched off. One road went to Hanover, the other to Dresden. Mike was still pale after his visit to Ordruff, and George poured him a whiskey. I can't understand how the Germans got to this point, Mike said. Our soldiers could never have abused the bodies the way the Germans did. Not all gains can stomach it, Patton's deputy chief of staff interjected. Once we led all the inhabitants of a German town through one of the concentration camps. Back home, the mayor and his wife had slit their wrists. Well, that's the most encouraging thing I've heard, Mike said. It shows that there's more to some of them. When news of the gold hoard reached Third Army headquarters, Patton ordered the censors to keep it out of the press. One of the censors broke the ban, and George immediately banished him. This caused resentment among journalists assigned to the Third Army. By the time Eisenhower arrived, they still had not calmed down. Patton, however, stated that he was little moved by the uproar raised over the affair. I know I'm right, he exclaimed, stabbing a piece of steak with his fork. Damn it, Ike interrupted him. Until you said so yourself, you may have been right, but if you insist so stubbornly, I'm convinced you're wrong. George winked at me across the table. Mm, but why keep it a secret, George? I laughed. Why do you need all that money? George grinned smugly. The Third Army is divided into two camps on this issue, he declared. Some believe that the gold found should be used to make medallions with the inscription lucky for the entire Third Army, down to the last soldier. Others believe that the Third Army should hide the treasure until times of peace, when Congress will again cut off credits for the armed forces. When money gets tight, the army will dig up its treasure and use it to buy new weapons. Ike shook his head, looked at me, and laughed. He's not going to be a man of his word, he said. They split up around midnight. Eisenhower and I took two adjoining rooms in the Commandant's house. Patton wandered to his trailer, which was parked nearby. His watch had stopped, and he switched on the radio to find out the time. Suddenly, the voice of a BBC announcer announced that the President of the United States had passed away. George knocked on my door and opened it. I'd had just laid down. What happened? I asked. Let's go to Ike's together, he replied. The President is dead. We sat in Ike's room until almost two o'clock in the morning. The next morning at breakfast, Patton sullenly told me that his attempt to free the prisoners of war had failed. A fortnight ago, he had sent a reinforced tank company with the task of breaking through the enemy front on the main and freeing our prisoners of war in a transfer camp located in the German rear 80 kilometers from the front. I did not learn of this expedition until two days after it had set out. It caused unhappy talk and gossip in the headquarters of divisions and corps, which reached the headquarters of the army group. It was Patton's most audacious move of the entire war. The story began with a zany idea and ended in tragedy. It began on 26 March. On the evening of that day, a battle group formed from the 4th Armoured Division broke through from a pre-bridge fortification on the main river, south of Aschaffenburg, and headed for the town of Hummelburg. Near this town, according to intelligence reports, was a transit camp overflowing with American prisoners. 
The battle group consisted of 50 vehicles, including 19 tanks and assault guns, and had 293 soldiers and officers. It was commanded by a 24-year-old tanker from the Bronx, the youthful Captain Abraham Baum. Along for the ride was Major Alexander Stiller, Patton's dashing aide-de-camp who had been a sergeant in the tank forces back in World War I. As soon as Baum's group entered the town of Schwiegheim beyond Maine, it was caught in enemy crossfire. Forty-eight hours later, at noon on 28 March, Baum's tanks, of which only one-third remained, smashed the prison at Hamelberg. Jubilant prisoners of war poured out of the prison gates and scattered into the surrounding hills. Daim gathered his soldiers, who had not slept for two nights, and tried to go back. But the enemy brought up the rear and threw tiger tanks against him. The next morning, 29 March, at nine o'clock, the wounded captain with a handful of remaining soldiers surrendered as all fuel and ammunition had been used up. This sortie would not have been noticed had not Patton's son-in-law been among the prisoners in this camp. Patton assured me that he did not learn of it until nine days after the raid was over. He was tormented by the fear that the newspapermen might attribute to him a personal interest in the affair. In his diary, George admitted that the whole thing was a silly fiction. I can say that during the entire campaign in Europe, I do not know behind me a single mistake, except for the fact that I sent a battle group of the armoured division in Hamelberg. The battle group could have successfully completed its task, but the raid was a costly diversion for the Third Army advancing north on Kassel. In ordering this sortie, Patton thereby made a mistake. Undoubtedly, had George consulted me, I would have forbidden him to send this company. Although I regretted Patton's rash decision, I did not rebuke him. Failure in itself was worse for George than any reprimand. The Ninth Army stood on the Elbe, the first on the Melde, the German group surrounded in the Ruhr, melting under the blows of three corps. Now I was preoccupied with the question of how to organize an offensive to the southeast, to drive the enemy out of Bavaria and clear the US occupation zone up to the Austrian border. From Bavaria we were to go down the Danube, reach Vienna and cut off the enemy retreat to Redoubt. However, the thought of having to occupy the entire American occupation zone gave me particular uneasiness. We were obliged to withdraw our troops from the Russian zone of occupation, but we had no guarantee that the Red Army would voluntarily withdraw from our zone. Therefore, we preferred not to tempt fate and check how the Russians fulfilled the agreement, but to clear the American zone of German troops with our own forces, without the help of the Red Army. At first I said was Hodges that I wanted to end the war with the offensive of the First Army down the Danube. However, the regrouping of forces would have entailed too costly a change in supply lines, and in the end I decided the offensive in Austria to entrust Patton, reinforcing his Third Army divisions of the First Army, arriving from the Ruhr. On 16 April, Devers and Patch came to Wiesbaden to work out a general plan of attack. The Third and Seventh Armies were to move in the same line. Patch was not at all happy about the prospect of advancing with Patton. He feared that Patton would seize too wide a strip of the offensive at the expense of the Seventh Army's strip. The Seventh Army had crossed the Rhine and was now advancing on Nuremberg, where Hitler had built a colossal stadium. Patch had battled to win the right to his own offensive lane, and so understandably he was unwilling to share it with anyone. The next day, as the Russians pounded across the Oder, launching their last major offensive of the war, we for our part gave orders to start an offensive on the Danube. The First and Ninth Armies were to take up defences in the centre of our front, from the Seko-Slovak border to the point on the LB where the American occupation zone bordered the British. The Seventh Army was advancing towards Munich, while Patton was advancing down the Danube. However, the Red Army, having captured Vienna, was moving further west, aiming to reach Linz. It was as if the Soviet command was endeavouring to keep us no further into Austria than was necessary. For almost a fortnight we tramped on the Elbe and Molde, waiting for the approach of the Russians. Every day the nervousness of our army commanders increased. They were afraid of a clash with the Russians if the latter began to advance further west of the Elbe, seeking to occupy their entire zone of occupation. We did not know what orders the Soviet commanders had given their troops, but I instructed the army commanders to hold the forward positions until we could begin an organized withdrawal into our zone of occupation. However, in case the Soviet commanders insisted on an immediate advance to the border of the Soviet zone of occupation, I authorized the army commanders to enter into direct negotiations with the Soviets and to make arrangements for the withdrawal of their troops. Let's do it this way, I said to Simpson. 
We would prefer to remain in our present positions until we have made arrangements for an organized withdrawal of our troops. But if the Russians demand an opportunity to advance to the boundary of their zone of occupation, we will not quarrel with them. Make the best of it, and let them advance. We expected to create quite a tense situation when we met the Russians, and I did not want to risk a clash that could lead to war. It was not until the 1st of July that the Russians put me on notice that they wished to exercise their right to occupy all their territory beyond the LB. At three o'clock in the afternoon we were warned that Red Army units would march the next morning at dawn. No, tell these fellows. I instructed my liaison officer to keep calm. It will take us at least 24 hours to withdraw our troops. The Russians agreed to wait, but they followed literally on the heels of our retreating troops. By 14 April, the British had reached the LB in the north near Hamburg, and General de Latre de Tassini's French army had broken through the Danube to the Swiss border. Tens of thousands of German refugees rushed to the American lines on the Elbe, hoping to escape the Russians. We were turning them back, and in the rear areas, officers in the military administration division faced a daunting task. Where to put the more than one million displaced people who wandered aimlessly along the roads? At first we tried to collect... Baltic and Polish inhabitants in the eastern districts, which were to be occupied by the Soviets and from where the Red Army authorities could repatriate them without much difficulty. But to our surprise, we saw that the displaced persons feared the Russians even more than the Nazis and continued to flee westwards. The number of prisoners of war was increasing with such rapidity that we no longer had time to count them. In one camp alone, 160,000 people were rounded up. The supply of food for prisoners of war and displaced persons put a heavy burden on our already overburdened home front services. Army commanders were therefore instructed not to accept prisoners fleeing westwards to escape the Russians. When a few days later the 11th Armored Division in Czechoslovakia informed us that it wished to surrender to the Americans, we allowed that division to come and lay down its arms, but on condition that it take its kitchens with it and take care of its own men. It was already the twelfth day of our vigil on the LB, and we still had no signs to herald the appearance of these mysterious Russians. We were told that Zhukov had stormed Berlin and Hitler had barricaded himself near the Imperial Chancellery. We were also informed that Konev had forced the Oder and was advancing towards the LB. However, all these reports were sketchy and unofficial. Even now we still had not established direct contact with the Reds. Although on all ranges of our tank radios, only the voices of Soviet radio operators could be heard and aerial reconnaissance noted Soviet wagons on the roads. Not a single soul had yet seen a living Russian soldier in our forward positions. In an effort to establish contact with the Russians, Hodges stretched his 69th Division in depth on a narrow ledge from the Malde to, to the LB and waited for the Russians to approach on the left bank of the Elbe. However, to guarantee the troops against accidental bombardment by our all-Russian aircraft, he instructed them to camouflage and escape observation. On the morning of 24 April, the Press and Psychological Warfare Department telephoned Wee Spaden that a statement from the three powers would be issued today at noon Washington time to make contact with the Russian troops. Hmm, so what the hell can they make such a statement? I said, because we still haven't established contact. Well, replied a calm voice to me. That day, a delegation of senators arrived at the task force headquarters, travelling through the European theatre of war. How long do you intend to fight? asked one of the senators. I looked at him in amazement. We in the Midwest need agricultural machinery, the senator explained his question, and we have been told that our demands will not be met because you need steel. How long is this mess going to go on? I gritted my teeth and did not immediately find a polite answer. The senators left, but the next day a group of publishers from the United States arrived by plane, touring the front. They stopped in Wiesbaden for a quick look at the situation at the front, then, after a tour of the death camps, were to head for Luxembourg. Are you ahead of schedule or behind? One of them asked me a question when I showed on the map the line of our front running along the Elbe. I'll tell you this, I replied, glancing at the Coton Peninsula, which jutted into the sea at the other end of the huge 6.5 metre map. If a year ago on the 6th of June you had assured me that today we would be on this line, I would have agreed and asked no questions. On this day in the evening I returned after dinner to my trailer to get caught up on the work in progress. 
Shortly after dark, I received a call from Hodges from his command post at Marburg on the banks of the River Lahn at 4 p.m. 10. Ten minutes on the warm spring afternoon of 25 April, a reconnaissance patrol of the First Army met the vanguard of Marshal Konev's first Ukrainian front in the almost deserted town of Torgay on the banks of the Elbe. No, thank you, Courtney, I said. Thank you very much for the message. We've been waiting a long time for this. The Russians certainly took a beating as they made their way the 120 kilometres from the Oder. I took a lump of coal from the box under the bench in my caravan and circled Torgo on the big wall map. Someone had already drawn a large image of a broken swastika over the city of Berlin in separate pieces. Quickly and skillfully regrouped, Patton on 22 April launched an offensive with the task of cutting off the escape routes to Redoubt. Two days later he crossed the border into Austria. From there he turned down the Danube to Linz, which is almost halfway to Vienna. Meanwhile, the British were pressing Eisenhower, demanding that one American corps reinforce Monty's troops in the north, who intended to cross the Elbe. Monty insisted on this reinforcement, claiming that his forces were insufficient to reach the Baltic coast and cut Denmark off from the Soviets. When Zhukov launched his offensive on Berlin, the pressure from the British intensified. They argued that if Monty did not reach the Baltic coast soon, we might wake up one fine morning to find the Red Army in Denmark and the Soviets on the North Sea. Now that Patton's rapid advance down the Danube had dispelled the myth of the redoubt, we agreed to meet Monty's demand. Ridgeway's 18th Airborne Corps was moved north to join the 21st Army Group. On 29 April, it moved across the Ilby south of Hamburg towards the Baltic port of Lübeck with the aim of saving Denmark for the west. By 30 April, the enemy was on the eve of total defeat. In Italy, Clark's 15th Army Group overcame the line on the Po River and rushed to Lake Como. In Holland, Monty's Canadians advanced as far as the dams on the North Sea and cut off Blaskowitz's troops. In Berlin, Zhukov's machine gunners fought their way through the ruins of that doomed city to the Imperial Chancellery, where Hitler barricaded himself in a bomb shelter set up in a garden. The entire German army was caught in three cauldrons that were increasingly narrowing. The Allied Air Force had ceased strategic bombing raids for lack of favourable targets. When Eisenhower called me at our new command post in Bad Wildern and asked about the situation, I jokingly asked if he had not prepared a plane to fly in early July at West Point to celebrate the 30th anniversary of our graduation. Apparently that's the way it's going, I said. I wasn't so sure a week ago. On the evening of 2 May, Radio Hamburg broadcast the news of Hitler's death. The message was preceded by the intermittent muffled beat of drums. We listened to this broadcast in Bad Wild Dungeon in the neglected Hotel Furstenhof, which retained the odours of antiseptic agents. Before we came here, it had housed a German hospital. Six months ago, the news of Hitler's death would have caused wild jubilation. Now it passed almost unnoticed. On the eve of Germany's collapse, the great tragedy of the German people overshadowed the death of Hitler who had brought that nation to the brink of destruction. And Admiral de Nitz, whose submarine crews had seen victory through their periscopes only three years before, was appointed Hitler's successor. He made a laughable promise to continue the war against the Bolsheviks. Himmler's whereabouts were unknown, although intelligence reported his attempts to enter into peace talks. When interrogated at Army Group headquarters about Himmler's attempts to negotiate, Dietmar was dismissive. Himmler, Nurture said, no one else will no longer obey in the German army. Learning that Himmler was reportedly the first to announce the death of Gigler, Dietmar grinned wryly. Uh, Herr Himmler, he said, is endowed with a peculiar talent. He can predict death. Although the Third Army approached the Czechoslovakian border a fortnight ago, it was not until 4 May at 7.30 p.m. that Eisenhower was able to predict death. 30 p.m. Eisenhower gave me permission by telephone to cross the border. The Third Army had been begging for weeks to be entrusted with this mission. Why? I asked Patton. Is the entire Third Army eager to liberate the Czechs? George smirked. Give Czechoslovakia. He thundered. Fraternization. What can you do to stop an army going into battle with such a battle cry? The liberation of Czechoslovakia was part of the Red Army's mission. We were not to advance beyond Pilsen, a town a few kilometres from the border. Patton objected to this halt, arguing that he could reach Prague. Indeed, if the Allied High Command cancelled his order, he would in all likelihood be at Wenzel Square in 24 hours. 
but when Eisenhower informed the Soviet command that our troops would move on Prague if the situation required it, it replied that we should not move beyond the line Sesk Budajovis, Pilsen, Karlovy Vary. Shortly after we met the Soviets in Togo, Marshal Kaneev invited the officers of the task force of my headquarters and the headquarters of the 9th Air Army to a banquet at the command post of the Ukrainian front on the east bank of the Elbe. At this first friendly meeting with their western allies, the Soviet officers greeted us boisterously and cheerfully. It was a short-lived burst of good feelings that lasted until the Kremlin abruptly cut all ties with the West. Russian banquets on Elba began with division headquarters, and as the custom spread, the headquarters of formations and associations tried to outdo each other in the abundance of whores de vuvais and drinks. Russian vodka and endless toasts to victory had already knocked the officers of several headquarters off their feet. This fate did not escape, and some officers of the headquarters of the First Army. So I prepared for the banquet on five May by eating as many buttered sandwiches as possible at breakfast and emptying a can of condensed milk. Before leaving for the banquet, Dudley handed each of us a small bottle of mineral oil. Now, ah, swallow this on the way, he said, and you can drink whatever they pour you. It was a cloudy, damp day when we pulled into a broken aerodrome near Fritzlar from where we were to fly to Leipzig in two C-47s. I didn't feel like going, and the overcast weather added to my bad spirits. Vandenberg glanced glumly at the sky. How is Leipzig? he asked the pilot. Almost solid cloud cover, sir. What will you do if you can't get through? We'll turn round and fly to Paris. What the hell? If we can use Paris as an alternate airfield, we can fly to the Russians, I said. I don't want to start all this again. You think like a soldier, Vandenberg smiled. He's too stupid to know when it's dangerous to take to the air. Collins met us in Leipzig and accompanied us on the journey along our corridor to Torgur. He had already made this journey a week earlier. As he approached the Soviet lines, he was asked if he had any objection to meeting the Soviet division commander. Of course not, Collins replied and turned towards the Soviet division's positions. The division commander apologized. May, permission to ask you a question, he said. Me, please, replied Collins. Are not your soldiers entrenched opposite us? No, dig in. Collins was surprised. Of course not. Among other things, we're allies, aren't we? The Soviet commander called in a staff officer. Hmm, cancel the order to entrench, he said. We'll stay where we are. In the ruined town of Torgo, on the banks of the Elbe, Several Soviet officers were waiting for us to escort us to Konev. A railway bridge destroyed by bombs had fallen into the water, and a temporary bridge had been thrown across the river. Carriage drivers were bringing logs from the nearest forest to repair the railway bridge. In the middle of the river was a puffing copper of rather primitive construction. Except for the steam engine on this copter, nothing had changed in Russian methods of bridge building from the times when almost 200 years ago, Peter the Great concentrated his armies in the area of Torgo, preparing to march together with the Austrians against Frederick the Great. In the right bank of the Elbe across the road, red cloths with welcoming slogans were displayed. A building beside the road was decorated with huge portraits of Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin. In the towns and villages through which we passed, somehow mysteriously disappeared all the Germans, and only once during the 32-kilometre journey someone's frightened face looked out of a shuttered window. Russian soldiers in soiled uniforms looked curiously at the American vehicles rushing past their bivouacs. At intersections, stocky Russian girls in boots and skirts let our cars pass, signalling with well-practiced hand movements that resembled those of English military policemen. We met a column of Soviet troops heading towards the LB. The column commander rode in a closed wagon and roared the harness through a black curtain like those I had seen on wagons as a boy in Missouri. Behind him were wagons loaded with soldiers and arms. Here and there among the sleeping soldiers, I could see a woman's head in a shawl. Conive, together with his staff, met us at the gate of a rather gloomy villa which housed his command centre. He was a man of mighty build with a huge bald head. First, the Soviet marshal led me into his office where I had a short business conversation with him with the help of interpreters. I handed him a map prepared for the occasion, on which were plotted all the American divisions facing the troops of the first Ukrainian front. The marshal huffed in surprise, but did not dare to show me the disposition of his troops. Even if he had wanted to do so, he would in all likelihood have had to seek permission from the Kremlin beforehand. 
American lieutenants on the LB enjoyed greater rights than Soviet division commanders, pointing to Czechoslovakia on the map he had received from me. Konev asked how far we intended to advance. He frowned as he listened to the interpreter translate his question. Only as far as Pilsen, I replied. Look, this line is mapped here. We must go to her to ensure their flank on the Danube. Konev smiled faintly. He hoped that we would go no further. On the table there was fresh caviar, veal, beef, cucumbers, black bread and butter in abundance. The centre of the table was laden with bottles of wine. Vodka carafes were everywhere, and the toasts began as soon as we sat down at the table. Konev stood up and raised his glass. To Stalin, Churchill and Roosevelt. He proclaimed the toast, not yet knowing that Truman had succeeded Roosevelt as President of the United States. Seated, Konev took a small glass and filled it not with vodka, but with white wine. The marshal has a stomach ailment, his interpreter explained. He can no longer drink vodka. I smiled and filled my own glass with wine. I was relieved that I would not need the mineral oil I'd already swallowed. After lunch, the marshal invited us into the great hall of his villa. A chorus of Red Army soldiers sang the American national anthem. Their strong voices filled the hall. Marshal Konev explained that the choir had learnt the text of the American anthem by heart without knowing a word of English. Then a ballet troupe performed, dancing to the accompaniment of a dozen balalaikas. Oh, it's marvellous, I exclaimed. Konev shrugged his shoulders. Hmm, they are only ordinary girls, he said. Red Army girls? A fortnight later, when Konev paid us a return visit, he was delighted by the virtuoso playing of a skinny violinist dressed in a khaki-coloured soldier's uniform. Ma splendid, exclaimed the marshal in rapture. Ah, that, hmm, I replied. It's nothing special, just one of our American soldiers. We kidnapped this violinist for one day from the special service authorities in Paris. His name was Yosha Heifetz. In the evening, when we were leaving Karnev's villa, the marshal took me to the garden. The orderly brought out a Don Stallion, on the saddle of which was embroidered a star, the symbol of the Red Army, Konev handed me a bridle and handed me a Russian pistol, the handle of which was decorated with beautiful carvings. Anticipating this exchange of gifts, I brought in my aeroplane Mary Kay new jeep, just received from Antwerp. On the bonnet of the engine we made an inscription in English and Russian. To the commander of the 1st Ukrainian Front from the soldiers of the 1st, 3rd, 9th and 15th American armies, Attached to the jeep was a shiny new carbine in a sheet, and we stuffed the toolbox with American cigarettes. I'll probably get a beating from the chief of control and finance and have to pay for it for twenty years after the war, I said to Hansen as I gave the order to bring the jeep from Antwerp. But to hell with it. We can't turn up empty-handed. While Alexander accepted the surrender of Kessering's troops in Italy, and Montgomery refused to talk about any terms of surrender with Admiral Hans Friedberg in Lundberg. We continued to advance in Austria, destroying those Germans who were still resisting, and taking prisoners of those who had ceased to resist. Rumours reached us that Germany was ready to surrender, and some German delegation was supposedly on its way to the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force. But Eisenhower did not bother to confirm these rumours. On 6 May I went to bed shortly after midnight after writing a letter to my wife. It was not yet 4 a.m. when I was awakened by a telephone call. In my room at the Hotel Furstenhof, the telephone was on the night table beside the bed. I got up and switched on the light. Eisenhower was calling me from Reams. Hmm, Brad, he said, it's all over. The radiogram has been... Jodel signed the act of unconditional surrender on behalf of the army, and Friedberg, ye on behalf of the fleet. The ceremony took place on 7 May at 2.15am, in a school building which the Allied Supreme Headquarters had requisitioned, near the marshalling yard at Reims, I ordered the telephonist on duty to call the commander of the Third Army and got Patton out of bed in his trailer at Regensburg. I just got a call from Ike George. The Germans have capitulated. The surrender will take effect at midnight on the 9th of May. We must stay in place along the entire front. We must avoid needless casualties. Hodges slept in a luxurious house he had requisitioned in Weimar. Simpson occupied the flat of the Commandant at the headquarters of the German Air Force in Brunswick. I communicated the news I had received to both. When I contacted Jaro, who had caught a cold and was lying in bed at a place near Bonn, 
It was nearly 6.30 a.m., and it was almost 6.30 a.m. I was in the middle of the morning, 30 minutes in the morning. I could hear the clatter of dishes being rattled by those queuing for the outdoor dining room outside my windows. I got out of bed and got dressed. The canvas bag with the maps was under my helmet with four silver stars on it. Just five years ago, on the 7th of May, I, a lieutenant colonel in civilian dress, was riding a bus down Connecticut Avenue to work at the old munition building. I unfolded the map and skimmed the flags of the 43 U.S. divisions under my command. They stretched across the entire thousand-kilometer front of the 12th Army Group. With a pencil I wrote on the map, D-Day plus 335. I went to the window, pulled down the curtains we used for blackout. The sun was rising over the horizon. The war in Europe was over.